Good morning, everyone. I just thought I'd check in with you and let you know what's on the agenda today. I'm going to be talking to Ross Clook, who's the son of Ranald, uh, <laughs> sorry, Crook. Uh, Ross Crook, who's the son of Ranald Crook, who's been detained in Qatar for the past six years, albeit he hasn't been in a detention facility like Jonathan Nash, but he hasn't been able to leave the country. And he's someone who's really invested a lot in, um, in Qatar and actually taken skills and relationships with commerce bodies in the UK and really promoted the country. So it's sad to see that uh, his local sponsors for his business are causing so many problems, not only for him, but also the, um, you know, it, it really is damaging the reputation of Qatar as a place where expats can, and entrepreneurs and investors can safely um, reside in or invest in or build um, the country up. Uh, we're also going to be talking to um, um, Robert Young, who's a stepfather of um, the detention in Greece that we'll be talking about um, later on. Um, so that's um, that's Connor, Connor William, the Scottish man detained in Greece. Um, looking forward to speaking to them. So we're speaking to Lauren, that's his sister, and Kyle, uh, his friend who started the GoFundMe page um, that's assisting them with the legal fees that they're facing based on this extradition request from Qatar which uh, allegedly is due to a little paraphernalia that he was carrying when transiting from Australia to the UK. Um, it's kind of a herb grinder, but the Qatari authorities uh, labelled it as a, a marijuana grinder and then have later accused him in the documents that I've now seen, uh, the Interpol Red Notice, as having carried hemp oil, which is obviously um, a health product. He, he didn't have it, so that's the funny thing. But even if he did, we're talking about a health product that has no effect on um, the humans whatsoever. Um, and the, I mean, I quite enjoy it. It's a, you know, rich in omega threes and sixes. But anyway, he's been accused of having hemp oil. Obviously, this is not a crime in Greece. And the Greek authorities have reviewed this red notice, which says that he was carrying hemp oil. And knowing that that's not a crime in Greece, it seems strange that the prosecutor has opted to push um, for his bail to be denied. Because frankly, if it's not a crime in Greece, he doesn't really pose a threat to anyone in Greece. The worst case scenario is that he escapes and goes back to England, uh, Scotland, where he could also be extradited. So it seems strange and more diplomatic that the Greek prosecutor has actually pushed for his ongoing detention. So he's going to be facing another hearing in uh, three weeks time. This is standard practice anyway, when someone is arrested for, um, for another country on an extradition request. So he's going to be um, in three weeks time facing uh, another appointment with the judge. If in that time, Qatar does not present evidence sufficient to proceed to the next phase, uh, phase two, then at that point he would be released and able to leave the country. If they present evidence that's sufficient to allow it to at least go to the next hearing, then we would hope at this point that bail is granted. But in any case, as you can see, there, it, it doesn't pass the dual, dual criminality requirement that Greece has with anyone who's going to face extradition. And furthermore, um, it, it would be unlikely that Greek would extradite him. They haven't extradited anyone else. Uh, any of our other clients who have been arrested there have been ultimately able to return to the UK. Um, so we're very confident on that. Uh, however, the fact is, if he's released at the next hearing, it means that he's spent uh, a whole month in detention. If he's released ultimately, at, if it goes to the phase two and he's released after that, where, where they rule that this Interpol Red Notice is um, an abuse of process, it means he's been being detained four months. So either way, this kind of, these arrests on the basis of a Middle Eastern country really have to stop. And that's why we founded uh, IPEX, which is Interpol and Extradition Reform. We want to lobby country, well, not, not just Interpol to reform, because obviously they have no incentive at the moment. People have to litigate against them and they need to be um, on the other end of, a, of a judgment, ordering them to pay for them to ultimately change or come under pressure from a government. So yes, Interpol needs to reform, but also individual countries need to 
review the way that they approach Interpol Red Notice procedures and extradition procedures. Historically, these kind of extradition requests were really for more serious crimes. They could be um, drugs, they could be murder, terrorism, this kind of uh, more serious crime. And therefore, you would think that a country wouldn't want to give them bail. They pose a genuine risk to society. But the fact is, we've Interpol has let numerous countries into their membership. They're African countries, Asian countries, and uh, Middle Eastern countries, and we have Russia and China, um, you know, top abusers. We have Turkey and, uh, and obviously Qatar and the UAE and Saudi. So we have all of these countries who are members of Interpol, who are able to report anyone they want, whether it's for political reasons, absolutely anything. Um, and Interpol will take that report and they will send it to all the other countries, all of the member countries. They will send this Interpol Red Notice. And with that notice comes a request to arrest that person and hold them, detain them, pending extradition proceedings. And they're asking that people be detained like Connor for allegedly carrying hemp oil. They're asking for people who have credit card debt to be detained. They're asking for people who have offended someone or have written an article that didn't go down very favorable, favorably with an oppressive country. So they're asking for normal people to be arrested that wouldn't otherwise be arrested in any Western country for sure, or any country that values free speech or has due process. So Interpol is requesting the arrest of these people and because of our uh, relationship with Interpol, we're actually complying with this. We're arresting these people and detaining them, as we're, we're seeing right now in Greece, detaining them without trial, without question of the red notice, without an analysis of what country has requested this detention. Is it a country whose request we should be respecting? So we're just complying with what what agreements have been made diplomatically let's say greece has made a diplomatic agreement with qatar an extradition agreement even if there is no genuine intent to ever facilitate an extradition that's been made at the the government level and with that comes this instruction that they should detain um, as per a more serious offense they should detain that person pending extradition in case they're a flight risk and in this case People like um, Connor are getting caught up and this is the kind of process that needs to be reviewed. So we're putting together actually an advisory for countries on what they should change as far as their extradition procedures are concerned. As we saw um, uh, with Hakim al-Arabi in uh, Thailand, um, he was a refugee in Australia and Bahrain had requested his extradition from Thailand to Bahrain, but he had refugee status in Australia after having escaped Bahrain, uh, who was essentially going to violate his human rights. Australia agreed to take him in, in on the basis that going to Bahrain posed a great risk to his life. Now, under Interpol's protocols, that Interpol report should never have even been able to get through um, to Interpol because of the refugee status. But anyway, it did. And uh, he wound up stuck in Thailand for months facing extradition to Bahrain. And Thailand would be much more likely to extradite him to Bahrain regardless of human rights violation potential than any other normal well, Western country. Um, so that, that particular release, and, and we're glad that he got home to Australia, but that was quite a consorted effort of a lot of different lobbyists pressuring Thailand to um, cancel their intent to extradite him. So it's these kind of processes that can leave people detained for months, potentially subject to extradition, um, but even if not subject to extradition in the end, they've been subject to months, if not years of detention. And we actually had a British national uh, quite a while ago now, but he was detained in Thailand on the basis of a UAE Interpol Red Notice. And he agreed on the advice of British government to actually surrender himself eventually to extradition to the UAE. He'd already um, completed two years of his, his sentence, basically in waiting in Thailand, and that had diplomatically been agreed to re remove that two years or have it count towards whatever he would serve in the UAE. 
But once he got to the UAE, it completely changed. They didn't adhere to any of the diplomatic agreements that they'd made. They did what they want. They added charges, added convictions, and there was just nothing he could do. So it's this kind of automatic process. I mean, Thailand probably would have extradited him anyway, even if he didn't surrender. But it's this kind of process that's really putting people's um, lives on the line. I mean, being detained in Ukraine for almost a year, being detained in Thailand for two years, um, and, and certainly Haki Malarebi would have been deported back to Bahrain and possibly killed at that point. So it's a very serious matter, and I don't think that there are enough standards in place and every country is different. If you get arrested in Spain, you're not likely, as, as in this case, um, you're not likely to uh, be detained for longer than say 24 to 48 hours. You're likely to be granted bail and then ordered to turn up for court hearings later. But you're gonna be stuck in Spain for a long time. And then Italy can vary. Sometimes they um, keep them in detention. Other times they bail them and order them to stay at a particular location, like a hotel. See, it's very different depending on where you're arrested and therefore it's really risky to travel and sometimes you won't even know if you're on Interpol. It's not going to go on the website. You have to do a check. There's a four month lag time during that process. So you could easily be detained and it's really important that when traveling that you consider, if you're at risk of being on Interpol, that you consider what jurisdiction you might possibly be arrested in because the extradition processes vary so much. So this is something that um, I'm working on is standardising or having recommendations in place that should be followed in the event that a country receives an extradition request from countries who are known abusers of the Interpol database. Because this is really important. If they are known abusers of the Interpol database, then we shouldn't be holding citizens for months on end. And we have a lot of data on, on this um, this practice so we can collate our data essentially and say okay in the past five years Qatar has made let's say 100 extradition requests and 99 of them failed on the basis that they were abusive notices therefore when Qatar makes an extradition request, bail should be automatically granted. See, these are the kind of recommendations that we want to make um, to, to countries who are members of the Interpol database. Um, the other thing to note uh, while I'm here is uh, there are other ways that Interpol can be used. It doesn't have to be a red notice. Sometimes if a country knows that someone they're after travels to a particular location, Rather than sending a broadcast message to all Interpol members, they can send an individual um, message to a particular country and they can say, look, hi Thailand, our guy travels, th this guy we want travels to Thailand regularly, so this is a message just for you. So they essentially use it as an email request. So just because you're not listed as a red notice and when you check whether you're listed doesn't mean that there aren't other ways that an extradition request can be made. And whether or not a country has an extradition treaty is irrelevant because an extradition request can be made to a country in the absence of an extradition treaty. So that's also something to be aware of. Um, anyway, I will, uh, I will head off and I'll have some chats with these family members I mean, Connor's family is really, um, uh, Robert was really, really distraught about not um, being granted bail. There's no reason for it. And uh, frank frankly, these unnecessary arbitrary detentions based on the whim of a, an abusive country who has a reputation for being abusive, it's absolutely a violation of human rights. And hopefully um, with Alan Stevenson, who was detained in um, Czech, who was detained in Czech, they actually ruled that his detention there was a violation of human rights and he's eligible for compensation from the Czech authorities. So this is something that, that Greek authorities should keep in mind, that detaining someone simply because another country asked for it can render them liable themselves. So hopefully Alan Stevenson will get some compensation even if it's a token indication that countries need to change and need to protect um, people who are being arrested and need to preserve their rights, that if they're listed on the Interpol Red Notice database, it absolutely does not make them a fugitive. 
often it makes them a victim of Interpol abuse. Uh, so thanks very much for tuning in everyone and I'll update you on uh, Ranald Crook and also on this uh, extradition a bit later today. Thank you and have a good Sunday.